Hey guys, Spud Cups here with a, this was more of a, I guess a personal video for a Twitch streamer slash friend slash adopted child of mine, uh, Reddy. Uh, you can check him out on YouTube and Twitch TV. And he actually pinged me in Discord uh, asking for help with a plane with this screenshot. Now, my solution um, to his uh, request was, because uh, he asked for some tips and tricks on planes now that he's got the basics down, my solution was to go into MS Paint and do a whole spiel and then make the video and post it and give it to him. But what ended up happening is because, and you could probably hear it, I got a new headset, new microphone, and I forgot to set OBS to pick up the new headset microphone rather than the old one, and so none of the audio recorded. So I'm just going to do my best to, like, post, um, like, post-narrate all of this. So uh, what's happened so far, I was explaining how I can't see his wings and control surfaces uh, because they are hidden by alloy. Um, but I can assume from the center of lift where his wings are placed. I can assume from the structure of the plane that instead of elevators in the back, he has canards in the front um, and, you know, ailerons and rudders and whatnot. And uh, I was telling him, really good job on the center of mass placement. Um, to the drag. However, the center of lift is really far away from the center of mass. And you can see in the illustration there, I'm showing that because the center of mass and the center of lift are so far apart, when you're going at speed, it's actually going to torque the plane and pitch it up or down. In this case, it's going to pitch the plane down the faster forward you're going because the plane is essentially hanging from the center of mass, uh, center of lift, sorry. <laughs> So uh, imagine just tying something to a string, right? That center of mass is going to determine where it's going to hang down, like at what angle. And the point where the string is tied to it is going to determine like what point it's hanging from. And you can imagine the center of lift as the string tied around the object and the center of mass being, well, the center of mass. And so as you're flying through the air, um, basically the faster you're going, the more that string is being pulled up, right? And so the object is going to have some inertia going going downwards and gravity wants to bring it down so the center of mass forward of the center of lift is going to pitch your aircraft downwards especially the faster you're going and it's not an issue really i mean you can compensate for that but if it's too far apart obviously it becomes an issue now here's a, a really great thing so most people have a problem with this specifically so his center of drag is behind his center of mass and that's super important because like the fletching on an arrow you have this, this, the forward part of the arrow, this big arrowhead, right? And it causes a lot of drag here. And if you didn't have the fletching in the back, um, the arrow would actually try to flip. It would be super unstable and try to flip around so that the area with more drag is behind the center of mass. Um, so the fletching on the arrow actually stabilizes it and helps it keep its uh, trajectory going straight. And that's perfect here. The center of drag is behind the center of mass so the plane won't be super unstable. However, the farther back this center of drag is from the center of mass, you're, you're gonna have problems with maneuvering because it's gonna be so stable that you can't go anywhere. It's like having a really, really big fletching on an arrow. The bigger it is, the more it wants to stay straight. It's fine on an arrow, but on an aircraft when you're trying to maneuver, it doesn't really help very much. Now, another thing is when you do have um, some drag in the back caused by your rudders particularly. Um, that drag sometimes doesn't kick in immediately, um, but since they're, you know, flat objects, if the plane's going like sideways, right? Like if it's at an angle, right, towards where it's pointed, like if you start yawing the aircraft, right, it's not immediately gonna go wherever you're pointing it. It has some momentum, some inertia, and it's gonna go in one direction. But the plane's gonna wanna like go back to where like it's gonna to wanna to point towards the direction it's moving because the drag on the side of those rudders is going to, like the fletching on an arrow, push it so that it's straight with the airflow. Um, and so a lot of planes, even in real life, do have an oscillation where they will oscillate and yaw back and forth a couple degrees. Um, I think the F-22 has like two degrees of oscillation, something like that. It's very small and very hard to notice honestly, but it's like, it's because that drag does have to kick in eventually, but like due to instability in the air, 
an airplane will naturally go side to side. Now, the problem comes in with these canards, however, although on this particular aircraft, I don't think it's a big issue. But let's say, you know, it's causing a lot of drag and it might cause your drag when you're turning, right? Especially in yaw. So if there's too much drag on the front of the aircraft, on the side of it, um, as opposed to the side profile of the aircraft on the back, um, when you yaw a little bit or when that little air instability pushes you to yaw one side or the other, if there's more like sideways drag, like the side profile of the aircraft has more drag on the front than the back, it will flip the aircraft around. Um, because, I, I mean, I keep saying it, I, <laughs> I'm tired of saying it, but the fletching on the arrow whole thing, it's like, you got to have um, more drag on the back in a three-dimensional point of view, not just going straight, but like on the side and on the bottom and top and everything. And I'm just labeling here these control surfaces because... I can't see them still. They're hidden behind all this alloy. I don't think you really need all this alloy personally. If you've seen my videos um, and you've seen my craft, you know I don't put all this covering up on my jet aircraft for uh, two main reasons. One, uh, or three really. One, it makes it lighter when you just exclude it. There's no reason to. Two, it's kind of a waste of space because you can just put more components there. And three, people are like, oh, it's going to get blown up in one shot. You need armor. It's going to get blown up in one shot anyway. If you have something powerful enough to like blow a wing off of this aircraft, it doesn't matter if it has alloy on it or not. Um, and it, uh, surprisingly, even in um, tests where I've upped the damage for like, modded gameplay, um, a wing can get blown off of some of my planes or like a whole section, a whole quarter of the plane, it'll still fly. Um, but uh, you do have to keep in mind that like instability can lead to maneuverability in, in this case. So um, the drag and the lift being closer to the center of mass actually helps you maneuver a lot more. And especially with AI controlled craft, because Reddy said he had uh, problems fighting steel striders jets, their missiles would always hit him, his missiles won't hit the enemies. Um, Instability can cause a jet to do this little maneuvers all over the place because it wants to correct its path. And so bringing them closer in or even putting them on the opposite side of the center of mass to make them make the craft more unstable would actually make it much more maneuverable. Now, I do think you should add flares, maybe a combination of, uh, let's say, flares and radar decoys, something like that. Um, and that gets rid of your uh, infrared and some of your radar susceptibility, right? But you're really always going to have a large radar cross-section with something like this, even if you use alloy or rubber, um, especially close into a target. And you can see this with the detection view using the middle mouse button in FTD. But regardless of how much you reduce your, um, your radar cross-section, the top and bottom of your plane are, in most cases, going to be the largest cross-sections of the plane, whatever you're doing, right? So close into a target, uh, if it's like a, a surface target or a stationary target, something like a ship or a building or something, don't fly directly over it. The radar missiles are going to track you immediately. And if you're close into another aircraft, radar missiles are going to track you. Uh, signal processors do help the missiles avoid countermeasures. But I'd say for your own missiles, go make uh, a testing platform. You want the missiles to be maneuverable. You want them to be fast enough. You want them to have uh, enough fuel. And it's good to just get like a baseline for it. Um, as for guidance assistance, uh, there are two that people most use, target prediction and uh, APN guidance, which you don't really need to know what it means, but it's um, augmented proportional navigation. And I explain it a little bit here, but if you're using target prediction, you need a little more fuel because let's say the yellow line is your target, right? And the orange line, the, the dot is you firing your missile. When the target curves, the target prediction on the missile wants to anticipate where it's going, so it'll take hard turns, use a lot of fuel, burn, 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 to try to intercept the target at a, um, at a forward time. And if the target is turning a lot, one direction to another direction, one direction to another direction, your missile's going to waste a lot of fuel because it's going to overshoot the target all the time. And you can actually adjust that in the missile menu, how many seconds it'll try to adjust for. However, if using APN guidance, I would say add a lot of maneuverability to the target because you want that missile to be able to catch that target when it gets really in close. 
And I would say, uh, as opposed to what a lot of people do in FTD, put the majority or all of your fins up at the front. And I try to do like a little force vector example here, but honestly, I don't think I did a really good job at explaining it um, in the beginning. So let's say that's your, the little X is your missile center of mass, right? And I think I change it to red here, but then you have your, your center of thrust, right? You have a force being applied to the back of the missile, right? And honestly, you don't really need to think about it too much, but essentially if you have your, your fins in the back, um, that force is basically just going diagonal ways and it's, it's working with itself as opposed to if it's on the front of the missile, if the fins are on the front of the missile or the majority of them, it's working against the, the thruster. And so it actually has more maneuverability. And it does matter how far along the missile you go. Like if you put a fin in the middle of the missile, it's just like putting, you know, control surfaces in the middle of the plane. Um, it's not going to have very much uh, leverage, right? So like on, on the plane, you want your ailerons on, on the far ends of the wings. You want them out as much as possible. You want your elevators either as far back or as far forward as you can. You want the rudders as far back or as far forward as you can. You want them away from the center of mass so that they have the most leverage, right? But on this missile, if you uh, think about it the same way you're thinking about uh, the plane, if you have two sets of fins, one at the front, one in the back, you're basically using two different points to spin it. But I would say the most important point is the front. You're, you're basically aiming where you're going rather than trying to push the thruster down. Um, it's like steering a car, I guess you could think of it like that. Like um, Wherever you have the drive of the car, you're having the, the steering wheels in the front, and it's just a lot more effective, um, whether it's forward wheel drive or rear wheel drive or uh, four wheel drive. Um, it's, uh, it's just more effective to steer from the front, as in the case of a fast moving object like that. But, um, as far as APN guidance goes, if you're using APN guidance, let's imagine this like the target prediction, um, example. So the yellow line is the enemy craft. You are firing from the orange dot. Um, what APN guidance does is it's kind of like how cats hunt, uh, or like tigers and like big cats hunt, I think normal Normal domesticated cats are like ambush predators, moreover, but the way cats usually hunt, if you've ever seen those videos of like the camera peeking around the corner and the cat doesn't move, but then the camera like goes back and then peeks around the corner again and the cat's a little closer. The way cats hunt, they try to stay at the same angle, right? That's how APN guidance works. It tries to stay at the same angle. And the reason they do that um, is to, from the prey's perspective, it looks like the cat is not moving that it's just somehow getting bigger. But in reality, it's getting closer and it is moving. So relative to the target, um, the missile's position stays in line with the firing position or wherever it's going. And this is augmented proportional navigation or APN guidance. And this actually uh, is used in real missiles in real life because what it does is it actually gets you closer to the target more quickly in many, many cases rather than a uh, target prediction of overcorrecting one way and then overcorrecting another way, uh, APN kind of keeps you tight and close. So you want more fins on an APN guided missile so that when it does actually get in close to the target, it can just go right into it. And I wish proximity fuses were still a thing on missiles because that would help so much. But um, regardless, I'd say APN would probably be better for like a faster missile, right? where you just shoot it off real quick and you're hoping it'll just hit the target real, real fast. Whereas target prediction, I would say, would be better for firing long range, um, slower missiles, hitting ships, things like that. Not for hitting planes. Use APN for hitting planes. Um, but, um, you know, as, as far as um, wings go, control surface leverage, I think this plane did a great job with overall design. I like the way it is, although I am worried about those canards. Um, I think I illustrate it here actually. As far as leverage goes from the center of mass, see, like we can draw a line here. This is like the center of uh, force of the, um, 
canards, right? And if you don't know what canards are, they're the elevators of an aircraft, but in the front. Um, as opposed to making the same thing, but in the rear of the craft. Um, and also, if, if they were in the rear of the craft, this would look a lot like an F-15. <laughs> it just looks like an Ace Combat F-15 with canards. Like, this is pretty cool. But um, you, based on the center of mass, you do have a lot more leverage with the canards rather than rear elevators. And that's probably... I mean, you made the nose very long. If it were me, I'd just you know, cut it off real quick there. But there has to be something weighing the back down. I see... Um, engine radiators on the back of the aircraft there although those are definitely custom jets so i i don't know what they would be powering honestly i'm curious as to what that would be but um i do like what you've done with the detection it's um a single visual camera 360 that's what i use on most of my planes um because they can see through glass and um you definitely have no, wait, you have alloy plates. Okay, the alloy plates along the spine of the aircraft might be a problem because they actually block the uh, camera 360 from seeing behind it. But other than that, the glass is great because visual cameras can see through glass. Um, but I think you need a, um, what is it called? A uh, inter-vehicle transmitter so that these vehicles can talk to each other. It makes the detection so much more accurate, honestly. Uh, especially with just a camera 360, you need a little bit more of a pinpoint accuracy. Although visual cameras track very quickly, so if you're the only thing left, you have a decent shot of tracking enemy aircraft. Your only blind spot is below you. But this has been Spud Cubs. Have a buoyant day, guys, and good luck with your plane ready. Uh, I hope it turns out great.